Hey everyone, I don't know how impressive this might sound, but I think I might have picked up a lifetime supply of high speed steel tool blanks for about 35 bucks. I don't know how I managed to do that. 5 10 by 200 mil blanks would normally run me about 100 bucks, so I think I got really lucky with the sale. I've been meaning to buy some more high speed steel for a while now. For the longest time, I've been cycling through these three or four blanks, probably reground the ends of them five times and I'm quickly running out of material. So given that I was already going to grind these blanks into lathe tools, I thought it would be a good idea to go into detail about the process that I go through in deciding how to grind these tools. And by no means am I an expert in doing this, but I've ground my fair share of tools over the years. I've made my share of mistakes, so hopefully you'll be able to learn something. So let's start from the beginning. This is a blank of high speed steel, typical to one that you'd buy. It's 200mm long and 10x10. 10 10. High speed steel is a really good cutting tool material, mostly because of its hardness and wear resistance. For example, this parting blade is between 66 and 69 Rockwell C hardness, which is a lot harder than most kitchen knives. The beauty of high speed steel though, at least compared to a carbon steel, is its ability to sustain that hardness and wear resistance at high temperatures. Regular carbon steel starts to lose its temper and hardness at around 200 degrees. High speed steel is also great because you can shape it into any shape required. It's not hugely brittle, it's pretty affordable, and you can just resharpen it and reuse it when it gets dull. The only real downside I have with high speed steel is that you do have to grind it into a tool yourself. And unless you have a jig or tool and cutter grinder, grinding tools by hand is not always an exact science. Sometimes I'll grind a tool and it won't cut all that well, so I'll have to go back, take a little bit more off the cutting edge, and it will cut a lot better. All that is to say is it takes a little bit of practice, a little bit of time to learn, but it's certainly worth learning it. On smaller powered lathes, high speed steel tools will net you a lot better results than you would get from carbide inserts. So let's get into the tool itself. I'll try and convey it a little bit different to other videos that I've seen. With cutting tools, there are really only two things that matter. The cutting geometry, how the cutting edge removes the material, and the shape of the tool itself. Once you learn one, it's quite easy to pick up the other. Of course your skills at the grinder will play a role in this, but they will improve as time goes on. A good way to practice though, is to use some wild steel to make some lathe tools. They won't work well as lathe tools, but they work really well in helping you hone your skills. So first of all, let's talk about cutting geometry. But first, let's cut these blanks into a more appropriate length. I recommend that you use a grinder with a cutoff wheel. To demonstrate the reason for the grinds we'll be doing, I've loaded the blank into a tool holder and I've pushed it up against the workpiece. Optimally, we want the cutting to be done by the left corner or point. However, this whole front edge is rubbing along the workpiece. What we want is for the edge to taper away. Similarly, the side of the tool is also rubbing up against the workpiece, so we want that face to taper away too. Now in books and online, there are charts that will detail the optimal cutting geometries, but for a general purpose tool, we can safely choose 10 degrees without too much problem. So what we're aiming for is for the front face to taper away at about 10 degrees in both directions. To grind the tool, I'm going to use my bench grinder. Now these tools always make me a bit uneasy. I always wear a face shield and a mask because silicon carbide grit isn't something that you want to get in your eyes or breathe in. And I understand the irony of warning about safety whilst this grinder doesn't have a guard. This one unfortunately doesn't have one anymore, but as soon as the budget allows for it, this will be the next tool that gets replaced. For grinding, I'll be using a 40 grit grinding wheel. Some people have coarse and fine grit wheels, however I've always managed to get away making really good tools using just one. I set the rest at about 10 degrees and we can start to make a grind. Though make sure that you do dress it when you need to. 
When grinding, you're going to generate a fair amount of heat, so make sure you dunk the tool in water to get rid of it. And I don't know how easily you can see it on the camera, but when you see sparks on the top edge of the tool, it means the top edge is in contact with the grinding wheel. And after the first grind, the front face now falls away in both directions. The second grind we'll do will be to remove material from that side face. I'll keep the tool rest at the same 10 degree angle, and I'll make sure to heat the tool perpendicular to the grinding wheel. Before we do anything else, we'll need to hone the tool. The grinding wheel leaves a bit of a burr, which we need to remove. I like to use a diamond lap, but you can always use a whetstone if you want. And believe it or not, that's our first cutting tool done. This one here is set up to cut brass and bronze. Brass and bronze are very odd materials to work with. If you use a sharp cutting tool with brass, the tool tends to grab into the workpiece and can actually dig into the workpiece and ruin it. So let's take a test cut. I could have probably used a higher RPM, but the tool cut fine. What isn't fine though is the surface finish. I left the tool with a very sharp corner, which is great for getting into corners and taking very light cuts. For example, I'm taking a cut of 0.025mm without much issue. But to get a good surface finish, I'd need to take a very low feed rate. As well as the poor surface finish, the small corner is not very strong. Take a heavy cut or use the wrong speed and feed and the corner will just burn off. All of this is to say, for most cutting tools, you'll want to add a corner radius. Pretty much just round off that sharp corner. Normally you'll do it using the grinder and then finish it off using the lap. The corner doesn't have to be perfect. Typically I'll just eyeball it. I prefer to have a smaller corner radius. The larger the corner radius, typically the better the surface finish, but as you increase the radius, the higher the tool pressure and the harder it is to do finer passes. So I typically stick with a smaller corner radius. I'll also point out that the corner radius will also dictate the corner fillet that you'll cut. So now that we have a brass cutter, there's only really one last cutting edge that we need to worry about, and that's the top. The top needs to fall away from the cutting edge, so the tool can shear the material a little bit more easily. I just took a half mil depth of cut in mild steel, and the result wasn't that great. Like the other faces, I'll grind in a 10 degree slope. And that's a 10 degree slope to the side and 0 degree sloping back. So let's give it a shot. To be honest, that was pretty good. I could certainly extract a little bit more from this tool, but as a general purpose tool, that was a pretty decent cut.
For a general purpose tool, if you can grind a tool that cuts like this, you are 90% of the way there. Before I move on, let me quickly touch on chip breaking. The mild steel broke a chip nicely, Galuminium did a lot better than I expected, though aluminium typically has a reputation for making long stringy chips, and the cold roll steel was not good at all. Typically what you're aiming for is for small chips, because long chips can easily get pulled into the chuck and that isn't safe. Unsurprisingly, the most difficult material, apart from plastic, to break a chip with is aluminium. I've tried a lot of different types of chip breakers, but I think I found one that works for me. It takes a bit of trial and error to get used to, but what I do is I grind the material that's behind the cutting edge away, and I curve it in such a way that the chip is forced to curl up underneath the tool, and that should cause it to break. It's not easy to nail on the first go. I've done this to several tools, and it works consistently once you nail it the first time. And whilst I'm on the subject of chip rakers, I'll go ahead and grind one for steel. We'll start out using our original tool. I'll go to the grinding wheel, and I'll hold the tool vertically, and I'll use the edge to grind in a small step down. Looking at the front, you'll see I've tried to maintain that 10 degree side rake, though hopefully that step up will cause the chip to curl up and break. Before I move on, I'll give you one advantage of being able to make your own tool bits. I have a 60 degree live center supporting the part. If I wanted to remove more material, I'd either have to rotate the tool to stop it from hitting the live center, and that would end up changing the cutting geometry. Alternatively, we can just grind away enough material from our tool to prevent it from hitting the center. The final thing that I'll touch on before moving on is the subject of back rake. Cutting tool charts will generally dictate that the top face slopes backwards as well as sloping to the side. I've tried this a few times and generally I haven't noticed huge gains when machining. I ground up this mild steel tool with back rake to show you the problem that I have. The problem that I have with these is that as you grind and re-grind the cutting tool, the cutting edge drops, and as well as that, the life of the tool is limited. The cutting edge can't drop back forever, so eventually you'll just have to re-grind it from scratch. You can certainly play around with it, but for me, when I do my machining, I never include a back rake. With that out of the way, we can now focus on the shape of the cutters themselves. And as long as you remember to bake the appropriate cutting geometries into your lathe tools, for the materials that you're working with, the tool should work no matter the shape, at least generally speaking. I'll go through the common shapes that I've ground, but before I do that, let's go back to the mild steel tool. One of the reasons why lathe tools don't usually have these long straight cutting edges is because you'll run into issues once you start to resharpen it. I took it to the grinder to simulate what many cycles of resharpening would result in. The material has been ground away, and the cutting edge is pushed back behind the side of the tool. If you need to get into a corner, you might risk inadvertently ramming the tool into the workpiece. And that's why most general right hand cutting tools have a 10 to 15 degree approach angle. As the tool is reground over time, we can maintain that cutting edge and shape of the tool. The tool's life is pretty much as many times as you can resharpen it before you run out of material. And if you can grind this tool, you're pretty much 99% of the way there. This is the tool that you'll use probably 90% of the time. Just remember to bake the correct rake angles and clearance into this tool for the materials that you are cutting. And something that might not be as obvious, when you grind the side rake into the tool, 
you need to hold the tool so that the cutting edge is parallel to the grinding wheel. If you grind the tool flat, the cutting edge will be on an angle. So that's our general right hand tool. It cuts from the right to the left, hence why we call it a right hand tool. Another useful tool to have is the left hand tool. It's pretty much a mirror copy of the right hand tool, and it cuts from the left to right. You may not use it too often, but there are certainly occasions where I've needed them. And they are ground the exact same way as the right hand tool, just the opposite. The biggest use that I get from left hand cutting tools is using them to face large diameter parts. However, this one will probably end up in a fly cutter. Whilst I'm on the subject, I might as well mention form tools. Form tools are used to transfer profiles onto workpieces in a repeatable way. The most common application that I use form tools with is to form a radius on a workpiece, and it's usually decorative, so I can freehand it on the bench grinder. With form tools, you don't typically want to have any top or back rake. With form tools, there's also a lot of contact, so it's best to take it slowly, and if the part is long or very thin, it's a good idea to add rigidity to the workpiece using a live center. For larger or more precise work, you can always make your form tools using a carbide cutter on the milling machine, or you can make the part using a quench hardening tool steel to save your grinding wheels and end mills. In the past, I've also used router bits as form tools. It's a precision ground radius, and it works really well on softer metals such as brass and aluminium. For one-off form tools, I also like to use high-speed steel twist drill and end mill shanks. Typically the shanks won't be as hard as the cutting flutes, but they do a really good job in softer metals, and it saves you using up your expensive high-speed steel blanks. For boring bars, I generally prefer to use carbide. Typically, unless it's a small part, carbide boring bars are just easier to use, plus you don't have to waste a whole bunch of high-speed steel being ground away and cut out to form the necessary clearance. You can buy or make holders that will hold high-speed steel inserts, but at the end of the day, I just prefer to use carbide. However, if you do choose to use high-speed steel, just remember that the cutting geometry still applies. And that for the most part should sum up basic lathe tools. I know I didn't touch on thread cutting tools, and to be honest, I haven't ground many of them before. I just prefer to use carbide inserts for cutting threads, but there are some really good videos out there which go through how to do it. If you want to have a look at the exact cutting geometry for various materials, I'll leave a link in the description. There are some good charts online, and there's a really good chart in the Engineer's Black Book, which I recommend getting. Anyway, I hope that was interesting, and I hope that was helpful. And with that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next one.